Okay, yeah, so there's a lot of fake news on U32 <laughs> on the internet. That's why I'm doing this talk, okay? Um, <laughs> no more fake news. So the U32 classifier has been around since about kernel 2.1. There's once in a while there's some maintenance bug fixes, but it's pretty stable. Uh, and once in a while, some guy who wants to make it perfect shows up, like Alviro the other day, making fixes, make sure if you have this condition matching with that, something is going to break. But in general, it's been pretty stable. Okay, the, the prob this is not a talk about TC, although uh, I'm, go I'm just going to mention that the classifier action block is where U32 fits in. Close the door. Uh, and you have a net device which connects, which has a QDisk attached to it either on the ingress or egress, which then has a classifier action block. If you want to do some really cool things, then of you could uh, also have multiple devices connecting to a using a connection action block. As a matter of fact, uh, and if I take this and look, peek inside, you, a connection action block has multiple chains. Uh, with the def with default, there's only one, and you can have different kinds of classifiers. So you can have a firewall FW mark classifier. Uh, you can have uh, BPF, but one of these. So I'm going to be looking at one kind of classifier that U32 uh, that TC supports, called uh, U32, and I have the answer for you, Tom. This is the classifier you're looking for. I hope, I hope to be able to convince you by the end of this. It's been around forever, it's stable. You can go back to kernel 2.1, run your scripts, and it'll work the same way, okay? So uh, what, is, what does U32 do? It's a very low-level classifier. Um, so it confuses people sometimes. That's the other reason I'm here, other than the fake news. So uh, it, you specify, it knows you have to know how your packet format looks like, specifies an offset into that packet, you, to, uh, to which you specify a mask, uh, a 32-bit mask. You grab the result of the ending of those two fields, and you match it against a value. So that's all U32 is, and how you end up composing your policy based on the, just, these two, uh, just this simple rule. Uh, that's where the richness is. It supports both exact uh, exact matches, which means I can just say match 10, 10 0, 0, 100. It supports prefix, which is the routing guys uh, use, uh, slash 32, 24, 16. It also supports tenary. I can just say match 0, uh, the mask is 0, x, f, 0, f, 0, f, 0, if I wanted. So very... Uh, the TCAM people will understand what that means. And with those rules, with those three possibilities of matching, which is actually P4 seems to be specifying tenary exact and prefix matches as well, I can specify a policy, what offset to use, and uh, what kind of uh, mask to use, and the result to compare against. So uh, because it uses these basic rules, you can actually teach it how to classify for you. And I, I, I'm, I'm going to try and explain those details. I, I should also emphasize that uh, scriptability is very important, in that you don't have to go and change the kernel just because you've discovered you've got a Geneva header or uh, that you want to support IFE or the new IFA telemetry or whatever. You don't have to write, change the kernel. You just have to change. You have to, te to teach U32 where your offsets are, what they should look like, and in fact, uh, as I'll show later, it has ways to compute as well how to, how to jump around the packets in order to uh, satisfy your matches. Right, so that's what I mean by scriptable. It's the only scriptable kernel uh, classifier. Um, here's here's the, the basics of U32, and I'm gonna, sh I, like I said, I was, I'll show both uh, all with an IP packet. So here's an IP packet. Uh, if you want an exact match of 10 0, 0, 100, you specify it in a very low level definition. So uh, I want you to match 32 bits with this uh, value. 
and that mask at offset number 12, which is right there. So you take this source back, so once you install this into the kernel, uh, when the packet shows up, this rule will be taken, and um, if it match, it, it is either matches or it doesn't, right? So that's what an exact prefix looks like. You see the FFs there? If I want to specify a subnet of slash 100, so, uh, I mean 10 slash uh, 24, this is how I'll specify. See them, I just change the mask. And if I want to specify the protocol field, which is at offset eight, right here, that protocol field, you know, I, I would write out the mask of that sort, and I want to match it to protocol number one. That's the nibble there. Is it a nibble or, yeah. And uh, ICMP, this guy matching ICMP, right? So ternary matches is things that are in the middle. I can specify different masks, right? Well, yeah. Mark. Ten. Hex. That's a hex, right? One hundred. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's. Yes. <laughs> but but is it? I could also. I think what I did is I entered it as ten zero zero one hundred slash twenty four using the more human friendly way of describing this, and in the kernel it showed up like that, right? Um, somebody saying something. 64. Sorry, what? 16, yes, you're right, 16.00100. Okay, so um, now how does it look like in the kernel? So I'm going to show you a bit of an anim animation here. This is what we enter, right? When I do a dump of the rule from the kernel, this is what I see, right? Now, to a lot of people, this looks very mysterious. Oh yeah, U32, very bizarre looking output, right? But I'm gonna try and impress you with some animation here. So here, this actually has a lot of meaning and I'm hoping that I can describe uh, those details too. So the chain, as I had shown earlier, this is a, just a TC chain, all the chains, uh, when you specify any filter, if you had said flower there, it will say that this is uh, protocol IP, because that's what you specified, a priority of one, the classifier type is U32, and it's on chain zero. Okay, so that maps to the chain in this diagram. Um, the FH800 colon specifies the table. When I install a rule, I, the kernel automatically installs a root table, a hash table. That's U32 works on hash tables. Uh, and by default, it's, it has the ID of X800 there, hex 800. So, uh, so that's what that means, 800. And then the, you notice there's a colon there. And the other thing it shows here is it created a hash table of only one bucket. See the one bucket, bucket zero. It's called divisor of one. Um, so to even expand further in the next slide. So here it talks about the, where the chain is. This describes what table it is. And this here is going to now describe more details. Right, there you go. So there's three things that you should, so there's a hash table, there's a bucket ID, and there's the match ID or the keynote ID. So these numbers here, 800 maps to that one there. The missing zero there, there's a zero here, which matches to, uh, to the bucket zero. And the 800 hex matches to the 800 hex, which is the ID. Um, so that's what I ha so it has hash buckets in hash tables, which uh, each hash bucket will ha will have a keynote. So, in fact, what I'm going to demonstrate later on is you can a keep adding. I, I got to be fair to the guys on this side. You got to keep adding um, rules, and you can specify exactly where they should be installed, right? Um, So he is, uh, if you just keep adding blindly, you know, the kernel will just add them to the root table. There's only one root table, it's the default table. So it's gonna keep adding them, right? So you can see it becomes a linked list, essentially. It's not very fast. So packets are gonna be looked up and we'll walk the linked list until we find our match and we execute the action intended, right? Not very efficient. 
Uh, but you can add extra tables, right? If I, add, if I change my priority to a different one, so the priorities go this way, priority n, n plus m, I can have different ether type protocols, so this is protocol x, let's say ip, and now I have another root table added for that priority. So I, there are multiple tables that can be added, and this tends to map very well with hardware, okay? So, in fact, you can do genius things like this if you know what you're doing. And I'm hoping people know what they're doing after this, right? You can actually have a series of, hash of tables that can be interconnected to each other from port to port, right? You can either put this on the ingress, put some of it on the egress, and just keep redirecting and sending things, and packets just keep working, keep getting classified, and in f as a matter of fact, you can train it based on your traffic patterns. This is very important. Right, so not only can you train it based on what new protocols you have, but also based on what traffic patterns you have on your network and optimize the hell out of it just for your network, okay? You don't have to write generic algorithms that everybody uses and submit a paper to SIGCOM, right? So uh, I'm gonna show an example of this, right? Here is an example of something we, uh, we use in our LAN Right, I'll, we have a slash 24. We build a cascading of tables. It's got, a, it's got a access control list where any IP address that's not recognized will eventually fall through from the uh, top layer tables and end up at a default rule that just drops it and logs, right? Um, I have some animation for this. Okay. Here you go, so this is how you add a table. So I just, I'm just adding a table for with 256 buckets, okay? That's, the, that's what shows up. So I've called this table, I've given it an ID, table ID one, okay? Then, yeah, the handle is how I specify the ID. Uh, the divisor is how I specify the buckets. Now I'm gonna add a rule to that which says too much uh, at offset 12, again, the source IP, and <laughs> again, this looks funny, but uh, don't worry about what that means, but <laughs> I'm gonna add a rule, okay? And what's important is I'm gonna specify exactly where this rule should be added, right? You see the, uh, the address, I'm gonna specify the address in the hash table where it should be added, right there, hash table 11. One, one. That means go to, address number table one, bucket one, and I wanted to add that thing there. And I could have specified what the ID is, but I let the kernel give me one, so it gave me 800, uh, hex 800. It likes a hex 800 for some reason, okay? Um, okay, I said that already. Okay, next I'm going now to, so this is the leaf table, right? If I, if I go back to my previous diagram, that is, I've just created that table there, right? Now, the packets come this way, but right now this leaf, no, a leaf table is not connected, so I'm gonna create a root table and then link them. You see how I said it link there? Okay, so how do I do that? Here you go, I, that's the rule, right? TC, a filter add, I tell it exactly where to go. I, I ask you that on hash table 800, hex 800, uh, it's unfortunate, it's, you have to, if you specify like this, assumed as hex, bucket zero, you know, remember the dot there, the, the, the two columns. I want it to match on 16, this time we got it right here, 1600 at slash, uh, okay, this was intended to be uh, FF all the way to here, and how do you select, so, so first you match on the 16 zeros, uh, I'm sorry, this is correct, 16 zero zero slash eight, okay? And then you uh, uh, select, this is a keyword called hash key that selects the bucket for the next table, okay? So I'm gonna use the last octet to select a bucket. So an address like AB uh, 16 zero zero one is gonna end up on bucket one. Did, did that make sense or? Is it, Yes. Um, 
Okay, the experimental one is correct. This one here is correct. You guys have to, okay, just say good things, okay? Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, I think that one is correct, right? Okay, so it's that I have ABC1 slash 32 to 54. So, all right, moving forward. So basically, I can keep creating this, uh, th these hash keys to specify what the bucket ID is. Um, so what, what I've demonstrated so far is I can go to any offset of any packet, don't have to know anything about it, but at, at this point, I, I've still been assuming that these packets are not of variable size, right? What if you have a TLV or you have a TCP option or an IP option? Right, so that, we, my friends, we can do as well, right? Um, so you, you can specify a way for U32 to compute on your behalf uh, where the next table. So first you say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the uh, IP, uh, source IP if it matches, Please look at the header length. I want you to compute, to take that as your computation for the next header to, to, to that I'm gonna add rules past this point. So um, I say I just wanted to match uh, TCP ports, right? But you know, there may be IP options there. So I wanna compute the fact that there may be optional fields that follow the main header. Right, so the keyword is, so something like this, right? So packet, uh, I have said that to match, it's the same thing from before, ABCD slash 24, match protocol TCP. So I'm gonna say, look, I'm interested in TCP packets. I wanted to use the last octet as the key, uh, uh, as the bucket ID for the next table, not for this table, uh, and for your next offset in that second table, which is table one, I want you to use the IP header length, take that value, uh, shift it to, the, to by six bits, and then add that, uh, and then at that field is gonna be a new, uh, there's some keywords here, that field is going to be your new offset zero, right? So what I'm doing here is I've taken every, uh, every host in that slash 24, and I have computed, uh, I'm just looking at if it's going to match uh, SSH port 22. Is, is, this, uh, is this gelling with you guys? I think so, okay. Um, all right, so having said that, uh, there are hardware offloads existing. I had an Intel uh, IXGBE in, uh, at the office, so I tried to play, it, it offloads U32. Uh, I look at the kernel code, the Chelsios, the three models of Chelsio, Netronome, I, uh, and I, I don't know this STA mark, who, who that is, but they do offload U32 into the hardware, okay? So again, not, we're not talking here about Oh yeah, we support the five tuple classifier, which is uh, Tom's main comment that Flower has this 25 or 26 or 30 uh, classifications uh, that it supports because I guess it came from OpenFlow. Uh, and that humans understand when they see source IP. We, d we don't care about that. What you can do with, with, uh, with U32 is you can write wrappers around it. You can write a wrapper that when configured in the hardware or in the kernel, it says source IP, right? In fact, they exist, but nobody who uses U32 really seems to care that much about that. Okay, so how do you enable hardware offload? Just like in any uh, offloader, uh, offloadable TC, you turn, on, turn it on with uh, ETH tool. Uh, here's a rule. Uh, you add it on the ingress, assuming you have an ingress, you say on protocol IP, I'm gonna give it a priority of 10, and a trick question for you. What does 800 colon zero colon one mean? Uh, anybody? Bucket one, uh, table 800, hex 800. Bucket, 
bucket zero, and node ID, the keynote, is one, all right? And I'm just saying, go to, so I, assuming a single table, only the root table is available, there's only one hash bucket, I have just added it to that, uh, I, I'm asking it to match 1600, well, I, I don't think you need the 100, uh, and I don't want to put, skip software means don't put this in software at all, go straight to the hardware, and give it a class ID of 11, one, okay? So, the XGBE, at the time I was playing with it and I contacted the Intel folks, uh, Amrita who fixed some issues for me is a co-author and verified all this, this is all true, okay? So it can, uh, you can add up to 20, 45 rules, I don't ask me why, what 20, why such a number, why not 20, 43? Um, it can match only on those tuples, source destination IP, v4, v6, protocol, source test. Um, so it, it, it decides for me that those are, those are the only things it will support, okay? It can drop, it can accept packets. I love this class ID uh, feature. I don't know if the uh, uh, Mellanox guys are here, but that, that's a fantastic feature. I can actually specify the class ID as say one colon one, and the hardware uh, would take that and, in, uh, and send it to DMA ring zero, right? So I'm actually telling it where to go. Uh, the SKB edit, same thing as, uh, as uh, Mellanox, uh, when Ronnie and Amir were here before. And for some weird reason, don't ask me why, it seems all these hardware vendors like to support only 15 bits, right? Uh, so that is also not upstream. And it, it, it can do a redirect, but only when you have SRIOV, which I'm not interested in, and an offloaded v Mark VLAN. So you can actually put your own hand-coded load balancer from TC, you, you're teaching the hardware, and it's gonna start load balancing across Mark VLANs, and you could throw those in containers, et cetera. There's other features that, I, that this hardware supports, I just didn't have time. We just wanted to do a quick paper for the conference, so we haven't looked much into those details, okay? so. I, I wanted to do some performance analysis and show some numbers. So uh, we created a baseline uh, set of where uh, we match every packet and see, uh, and just uh, redirect it. It comes on one port, gets, uh, there's only one rule in the root table. The next is we match, we add 254 and we pretend to be a dumb users who just adds things and doesn't tell the uh, kernel where to insert them. So they all get inserted in the root table, bucket zero. Uh, the next one is uh, I'm going to optimize it based on that uh, table I showed you earlier with 255 users. And the third one we say, what if we had 64,000 users? And we want to see what the performance difference is, okay? So the 64,000 users, if you're curious, looks like this. We have two levels of hash lookups, okay? So I should say that with this, if I, in my case, I'm interested in 64,000 source IP addresses, I can find any address in, two lo in three lookups, right? So th that's the beauty of this. My traffic patterns requires me to just um, look up on source IP on the ingress. I can now look, I can guarantee you that I'll find that IP in three lookups, okay? And in, in the previous example where I shared 254 users, I can guarantee you I'll find the, the lookup in two. Now, if you, you can write some very optimized thing, you will do it in one and a half, but this is scriptable, okay? I didn't have to change anything in the kernel, and I can, I can do variable header sizes, etc. cetera, okay? So this is the test setup. I found this tool called, we found the tool called T-Rex uh, that generates traffic at wire speed. Yeah, it runs DBDK. We have some really old clanky hardware. Um, so it sends on one direction. The system under test is another piece of hardware that will run one of those three test cases. It's a very, very old piece of hardware. It's the only one that had IXGBE on it. Like from 10 years ago, it's an uh, Xeon V2. And when you boot it up, it tells you very clearly that this thing won't support wire speed, okay? It looks at the, the, the PCI bus is very old. If you try to send bidirectional traffic, you can probably do like 60, 70%. The paper will have more details on this. Um, and so what, what, we, uh, what, what we did is we, used RSS to default to eight. We were trying to reduce the variable. The system under test is the classifier, okay? So we don't want any noise. 
get rid of the QDisk clock by using uh, MQ prio. Uh, and so all the tests will basically match and send or drop when it fails, okay? Was th th so uh, we try to reduce the variables as much as we could. Okay, so next. Um, this is how the egress path looks like. There is no QDisk clock at all. P packets come in, the MQ prior will select one of the rings, off it goes, okay? So if you look, uh, you'll hardly see anything. The only reason we have uh, the, the, the QDisk there, which is B54, uh, was on occasion we'd see Packets come in, go out, and then the ring is full and they get requeued to software. Right? The next time they'll get dequeued from there and pushed back into the kernel, into the hardware. This is the old beast. We, on, we only used one of these new nodes, and you can see the ports. Uh, I think two of these was going out, sharing the PCI bus, which was already insufficient for one, and we're using it for two. So we can't do wire speed on this thing, right? But still, that software could be a bottleneck. There's a, there's a lot of problems with this thing, but we just wanted to do some quick uh, comparative analysis, okay? So here's our results. When we ran the baseline, all it did was it had one rule to match everything, redirect it to the other port. We were able to about nine million packets per second, right? When we, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, this is the baseline with no, 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 no rules at all. The one rule to match all is what I just described. It has a TC ingress um, rule which matched one everything and redirected to the egress port. This is the one when we added, uh, I don't think I should be using this. So here, this on this one, we added 200, this is the dumb user adding rules without specifying where they should be added. Uh, as you can see, it dropped to about two million packets per second. Here's what we took this exact same setup and we built a set of hash tables. Uh, this was a single hash, extra hash table and we put each rule in one bucket. As you can see, we were able to shoot close to seven million. And this is the one with the, which I said was 64,000 users. As you can see, um, it's close to almost the same speed as, as, as one match. This is with a single match. Look at that, that's with 64,000 possible matches, right? I'm going to stop here and see if there's any questions. I still have some time. Or comments. Okay. Uh. So, um, Jamal, I didn't quite follow the part where you were doing the offset and the shift, is that actually something that can be done in a TC command? Yes, yes. So? It, it's done in the kernel. You tell the kernel how you want it done. So uh, theoretically, so for example, there was a TC protocol field. If I start with the assumption that my first packet is ethernet, in theory, we could just do this chaining and find um, the ether type, and then go to that, and then go to that, and then yes. go to that, and then go to that. Exactly. So this is, so I think your, your presentation was current state and more tutorial. So bear in mind, this right. is forward looking stuff now that right. we're entering into. Right. And this makes me realize it's probably a little harsh on the network vendors um, since we're kind of guilty of the same thing in some of the kernel, wow. um, kernel stuff. But if we step back and look at the, the essence of the problem, so this is the match action part of network processing, and that's required. Certainly, when, once we get into the IP header, we want to match an IP address. That's very common. In order to do that, though, this clearly shows we have to get into that header. Yes. So it's really not match action. What it really is is parse match action. So parsing gets us the header we're interested in, and then within that, we do matches on the fields in the header and then take the action. So, so Th the, it's a slightly different philosophy because parsing means you, you collect your headers first into some... Well, and, and so it turns out this, to me, this looks a lot like the, the P4 model. They actually do, they actually segment it into the parsing level, match action, and then 
I guess the, they the have some sort of weird the, the, thing There is the a slight difference. The, the P4 is sort of more like probably the dissector we have. You collect all the headers, and then you use them for something. You actually have a data structure which has, so the P4 people parse the packets and put them in some construct, and then you use them to, uh, to match, and then execute an action. This is doing it at runtime, right? I'm just walking the packet, and as I find things, I'm saying, yeah, this matches. I don't collect anything, right? I don't store any uh, uh, intermediate data structure that then gets used to do the match. Okay, right. so my second comment, right. um, again, this is forward looking. Mm -hmm. So the TC command line format, very hard for me to parse. So yeah. what happens is sometimes I'll use TC, I'll read the man page and I'll figure out the commands. I come back a month later. <laughs> um, it would be really, really nice to have a, an easy language to front end that. I, I don't disagree. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, it's hard to, for humans to read any BNF grammar, okay? This, it has a BNF grammar, uh, which is correct, formal, complete, but it's intended for machines, really. So someone needs to write a beautiful thing on top of it, but at the assembler level, I think this is a very good fit. That's, that's what I was trying to say. Well, I mean, for rare instance, like if I want to get the source address out of an IP packet, instead of expressing that as a numerical offset, I wish I could just say, give it a data structure and say source address and put source in instead of some weird, uh, some number that I have to compute. So yeah. it, it's just, I mean, it's kind of obvious, right? It's ease of use, so we like to, yeah. this is like assembly and we want to go up to non-assembly language. No, I, I don't disagree. I'm, I'm saying that by itself, it's too low level. Uh, if you know what you're doing, you can write your own scripts. Uh, and there's been attempts, even if you look at TC, the U32 uh, syntax, you'll see actually English syntax, which says IP source, and then you specify the source in, in quad octets, right? But uh, power users probably don't use it that much. But point taken, right? Any other question? So hardware vendors, why are you not implementing this? Ronnie. <laughs> why, why are you implementing Flower? Okay, I, I can see you need, to, you need to make humans happy. In the age of automation, do you really care about humans? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, <clears throat> because look, it can, do, it can do all the crap that uh, the industry Marketeers are putting out, uh, you, can, you, can, you can do this, look. Who is the customer that's using it? Well, why does it depend on the customer? You can write <laughs> some. I see, okay, you answered my question, I guess. My new boss, my b new boss, uh, right, right. NVIDIA is asking for money. Right. So we need to you know okay. a reason. But look, look, at that, look at that beautiful diagram I drew. Do you see that? <laughs> Just take this and send it there. You can do this. Yes, we can. Yeah, but you, can, you don't have to write any new code. So th th that's what we spoke, I think, before regarding right. a kind of a P4. It, well, it, it's P4 is, you know, you collect all. So that, that's the point. The parsing part is unnecessary. So um, to answer your question, Jamal, so yeah, yeah. we do support U32, but the point that Tom was making is very valid. The way hardware is done, you don't unite the parsing and the classification together because that makes for a very many tables. Uh, this is what would happen here as well, that you're taking you know, one action at a time, you're matching one table and saying, okay, now I have another header, I'll match that, and then I'll match another one. So that makes a lot of tables. So the way the ASICs are optimized, you definitely do the parsing up front, and then you have the classification table so that you reduce the number of tables you have. So that definitely comes, uh, the way the P4 is done, you separate out the parsing from the classification, it fits the ASIC uh, much better. But I mean, the only thing that I would say <coughs> is, Flower as compared to U32, U32 is definitely better because of the flexibility you get, which Flower doesn't give me uh, in terms of defining new fields or whatever. Um, the only other complaint that we've had is, you know, some of the actions, and which is missing from both uh, in case of uh, um, Flower and U32, and I, you know we have talked about it. What we could do about extending actions, which is which is uh, something that we still need to solve. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So yeah, if that's hardware re requires that you have to parse first, be then for some reason I'm imagining that you have multiple hardware tables. Any more comments to add? Or? I'm still keeping the time here, so. Oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, you have any, okay, so your, your message is show me the money, right? <laughs> somebody there wants to add, somebody wants to say something. Yeah, you, give me the cookie. Hi, yeah. speaking from another vendor company, we do FPGAs and P4. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'd like to talk to you. I'd like <laughs> to second that the idea that you really want to do the parsing first and then any kind of matching because uh, in the, in for FPGAs at least, it's a big pipeline. The packet processing starts at some point and goes goes through the pipeline. It has to be, it has to be parsed. You can't afford to do parsing in the, in the middle. But the, the other question is regarding this U32. Uh, do you know of any effort or idea to actually do uh, P4 to U32 translation? Is there any effort? Because other mentioned that it's difficult to understand all of this. And it might be useful or, or relevant to try uh, use P4 syntax and to compile it into this uh, uh, U32 syntax. Tom, did you want to add a comment to that? or? Or you, oh, you're taking a nap? You, you want to say something to that effect? Oh, the mic. Okay, we, we, there's a lot of interested parties. Maybe we should get together some coffee, good coffee in Prague and talk about this stuff, right? Tom is one I know. Uh, probably the vendors, Anjali, Ronnie, Shrijit. We can, we can uh, sure, if you guys say that you have to parse fast in order to make the hardware more effective, then all right, I'm not going to argue with that, right? And the, but the parsing is what they should be maybe describable in a human-friendly way. But the idea of, you know, I'm going to add yet another 25th tuple in open flow, that's ridiculous, okay? That's, that's a, it's, it's a problem. And, and flower models after, after uh, you're going to change the kernel. It has to, so the idea, the scriptability has to be maintained, in my opinion, that I, can, I, I don't have to change the, whatever's in the data path. No, it, it, this is a great background tool, but uh, getting it a P4 front end that would be user understandable, so maybe P4 uh, hardware friendly or stuff. It it could be something that uh, could really add some usability value okay. to this. Uh, okay. Uh, as a timekeeper, I'm going to say this last comment here, and then we go for break. Okay. So I mean, this is the this request for P4 is not any different from like why not do eBPF to generate TC, right? As uh, I mean, yes, we have n ways to define everything. P4 defines a pipeline, a classifier, and a um, parser and a match action table, right? I mean, the, like if you say P4 generates TC, then you have to support a much richer backend on the on the TC side than you would otherwise. Otherwise, you you're now creating artificial constraints that the user never knows, right? When I write the P4 program, I don't know what it's going into. There, there may be a case, and I think there is a case for saying there is a minimum set of P4 primitives, but at that point, you're back to TC primitives, and you might as well just stick to the TC primitives, right? So, so I think there is a uniformity question we need to address. So uh, I hope that I enlightened people a little bit on U32. They know a little more than they did before they walked in here. All right, with, and with that, thank you, everybody. <laughs>